It's now time for us to dwell into a panel discussion on de-risk the future. Preparing now for what's next, imagine the future and reinvent your business. To moderate the discussion, we have with us Tom Doktoroff, a renowned business leader and a global brand builder. He's also one of the world's foremost experts on Chinese consumer behavior and Asian commercial landscape. Tom rose to become the CEO of J. Walter Thompson, one of the world's largest global marketing and communication companies. He is often a commentator on CNBC, NBC, Bloomberg, and National Public Radio, as well as in the Financial Times, Bloomberg Business Week, The Wall, The Street Journal, The Wall Street Journal, and The New York Times. So, could we please have Tom on stage as we move towards the moderation of a session with two fabulous speakers? Our first speaker on the panel is Michael McQueen. An award-winning multi, uh, an multi-award-winning speaker, trend forecaster, and six-time best-selling author, with premium global clients, he has helped some of the world's most successful brands navigate disruption and maintain the momentum. Michael's first book, *The New Rules of Engagement*, was the culmination of a three-year study of the key drivers of the youth culture around the world. Michael's next book, How to Prepare Now for What is Next, is a useful glimpse of the key trends that will shape the coming years, including artificial intelligence, robotics, and nanotechnology. He offers a practical game plan for thriving in an age of disruption. In the year 2004, Michael founded a consultancy that specializes in demographic shifts and social trends called the Next Gen Group. He is also known for his engaging, entertaining, and practical conference presentations and has recently been named as Australia's keynote speaker of the year. Michael was inducted into the Professional Speakers Hall of Fame, so please welcome Michael McQueen. Our next speaker on the panel is Tim Reed, a multiple award-winning comedy writer known for, his, known for co-creating and co-writing the BAFTA-winning sitcom Car Share. As a world-class innovation expert, his passion combines the skill to help businesses become as creative as comedians. He has worked for some of the world's most creative organization in organizations, including global ad agencies, innovation consultancies, and the BBC. Tim started his career as an ad man at the J. Walter Thompson as a media planner before moving to McCann Erickson as an account director, then the strategic planner, and finally, an award-winning copywriter. So, well, please welcome our next speaker on stage. Ladies and gentlemen, here we are. Welcoming Tom Reed, Michael McQueen, and our moderator. Enjoy this discussion, and I'll see you on the other side. <clears throat> welcome. Tim, welcome, Michael. Uh, I think that today's session is really going to be lifting us up a little bit so that we're really talking about how it is that we can trigger and stimulate ourselves to reimagine the future. Now, our first speaker, Tim, is probably the most diversified guy I've ever met. You heard it that he did everything in advertising, media, creative, account, and planning. He uh, has written uh, an award-winning, uh, BAFTA award-winning series called Car Share. And actually, it was through that that he understood the power of humor to make us open our minds to different possibilities. And with that, I'd like to invite you to begin your presentation. Wonderful. Thanks, Tom. Yeah, I can do all of that, and yet I can't pour water without spilling a bit on my trousers. Um, yes, so uh, as, as Tom said, I'm probably best known these days as uh, the co-creator and co-writer of a BAFTA-winning sitcom called Car Share. Um, but really, coming up with ideas for new TV shows is just me practicing what I preach. Uh, because for the last 20 years or so, I mean, what a ridiculous career <laughs> it has been. But what I've been doing is really helping organizations around the world imagine a different future for themselves. And, and reinvent their businesses through innovation, through creative sessions. I train uh, organizations, I train teams in how to run uh, better idea sessions, how to collaborate together better to come up with 
bigger, better ideas and think more creatively. So running hackathons, idea sessions, thought showers, suggest fests. Why don't we call them brainstorms? Brainstorms. They were always brainstorms. That's what I do. I help people come up with better ideas through running bigger, uh, better brainstorms. And having run hundreds of these sessions, I recently had uh, a revelation. Um, and that is that there is a moment in any idea session, in any creative collaboration, uh, where the magic happens. Where suddenly we change from kind of looking at each other and scratching our heads and wondering, have you got something? Have you got something? And then suddenly something happens and the ideas start to flow thick and fast. And that thing is that somebody said something that made everyone else laugh. Somebody said something that everyone found funny. And when that happens in an idea session, the energy totally changes. Uh, and we all start being much more playful. And, and often the thing that someone said that made everyone else laugh can often be a genius idea. Uh, and so I looked into this and I thought, having seen it time and time again, this role of, that humor has in when we're having ideas, I, I realized I wasn't the first person to have noticed this. Because advertising legend David Ogilvy famously said that the best ideas come as jokes. Make your thinking as funny as possible. <laughs> the best ideas come as jokes. Actually, I mean, I'd seen it happen. I knew it was true, but it's kind of counterintuitive, isn't it? Because when we often get together to have ideas, it's often because there's a, a business problem, a big issue, a big challenge. Maybe it's a pitch or we're looking to re redefine our brand, reinvent the future. Big, serious challenges, and yet the best ideas come as jokes. But I knew it was true, so I thought, well, I'm going to think about this a little bit. As a comedy writer and a guy who's worked in every department within an ad agency, and then I worked at What If, an innovation consultancy for about 10 years, and I thought, well, I, I'm pretty well placed to understand this if it's true. If the best ideas come as jokes and we should make our thinking as funny as possible, what's going on? What is it? And I thought, if you analyze comedy, if you work out what is it that we laugh at, what, what is it that makes us laugh? And people say you shouldn't analyze comedy, probably shouldn't, but if you did, I think there are two main things that make us laugh, two things that we find funny. And the first is the truth. Right? We laugh at the truth. We laugh at things we recognize to be true. We laugh at the world reflected back on us. It's why a lot of stand-up comedy these days is observational comedy is a huge thing. Because we love to hear people saying, this is what's really going on. It's why sitcoms like The Modern Family are so good. Uh, and it's brilliantly written, but partly it's the concept, you know, that it accurately reflects modern family life. And for most of us, when we're watching it, there's someone in there that we recognize to kind of be us. And we recognize the situations they're getting. We find that funny. My kids are convinced that I'm Phil Dumphy, the idiot dad. But we find, we find the truth funny when it's reflected back at us. But the other thing we laugh at is surprise, right? When something that doesn't quite fit the way we'd seen the world up to then happens, that makes us laugh. It's why Melissa McCarthy playing Sean Spicer is just inherently funny. We didn't expect to see that. The truth and surprise are big sources of comedy, especially truth with a twist. The real world reflected back to us in a way that we hadn't quite seen it before. That's the root of any great idea. Any original idea comes at us as a reflection of the truth. Yeah, this is what's going on in the world. This is true to the opportunity that we're trying to leverage. But I'd never thought of it that way before. So it's surprising. So in an idea session, it makes total sense, really, that when we're knocking ideas around and then suddenly something happens and it gets everyone laughing, it's because someone said something that's got a real truth to it, but in a surprising way, often risky, often shocking, or sometimes provocative. But in those sessions, if we start to laugh, it's why I'm now passionate when I coach people in how to be creative, how to run those sessions. I'll say, if you start to see laughter, if some, suddenly something makes us laugh, see it as a red flag, that there's probably a genius idea in there somewhere. But the good news is, there's also, it's not just my hunch, there's some real science behind this. Okay, I looked into it more and more and found it. So Professor Karuna Subramaniam here, uh, a professor of psychiatry at UCSF, she did a load of research into this, the role of humor in creativity. What she did, she, she took a big sample of people and split them into three groups. 
Uh, and each group was going to get um, a creative task, some, a problem to solve, some ideas to have. The same, the same exercise. But the three groups were all given a different bit of stimulus before they were given this exercise. One group watched a comedy. They watched a Robin Williams gig. Another group, they, watched, they were shown a horror film. It was The Shining. Uh, and another group uh, were given a ton of information. They were forced to sit through a lecture in quantum mathematics. And then they were all given this creative task and asked to come up with ideas. And she found that the group that had watched the comedy came up with demonstrably more and better ideas than the other groups. And she also did MRI scans on their brains and found that those people that had been laughing, the bit of the brain that she most identifies with problem-solving, creative thinking, I think it's the anterior cingulate cortex, uh, was most stimulated by the group that was watching the comedy. So they were hardwired then to be able to come up with better ideas. So there's some science behind it as well. But so what? So, so what? so what can we all do about that? Well, I think what that means is that we can all, when we're looking to be creative and reinvent the future and come up with ideas and be more innovative, there's a lot we can learn from the world of comedy. In other words, if, if the best ideas come as jokes, how do jokers come up with their best ideas? Well, having worked with lots of comedians, lots of comedy writers, I've seen that there are tools and techniques and behaviors and mindsets that they get into that I now employ when I'm work, working with teams or organizations helping them come up with ideas. And I think you can split them into two main groups. So I'm going to share a couple with you. And I think the groups are about behaviors, about attitude, about mindset. How do people who are great at coming up with jokes, uncovering truths in surprising ways, how do they do it? Um, and then some tools and techniques, some exercises. You know, what are the things they do to help them get to that place? So I'm just going to share a couple with you. So the first is a behavior. They're playful. They're brilliant at knowing when to switch from being serious to getting playful. That's not handfuls of cocaine, by the way. That's, um, it's a sand pit. It's about, it's about childishness. It's about unleashing our imagination through remembering what it was like to be childish, to be playful. It doesn't have to be, uh, you know, like the Google slide that they have in, in, uh, in their, one of their offices. It can be, but it's whatever works in your organization to allow time and space to play. In fact, a famous comedian, John Cleese, part of the Monty Python team, he talked about this. When he was doing a lot of corporate gigs, uh, soon after one of his uh, expensive divorces, I think, when he was doing a lot of corporate stuff, he would say to people, if, if you want your workers to be more creative, give them time and space to play. And it's obvious, really, isn't it, I think, when you think about it. But it's being playful with the outcome is actually a big part of that. So when we're bouncing ideas around, one thing, again, comedians are great at when they get into a writer's room to come up with stuff, is they're playful with the outcome. So they'll start to have an idea, and they'll wonder where this could go. That's the kind of playfulness I mean. It's about wondering, where can this thought go? And if we're going to do that, we need a bit of this behavior, a bit of bravery. Uh, one of the things I think that stops us coming up with great ideas is when we're in idea sessions and we're sat around, and if suddenly it occurs to us, what if this is the solution? What if we did this? And you start to got, get a germ of an idea. The thing that stops us often sharing that, I've seen, is people think, well, I won't say that. I think people will laugh at me. Because this is an original thought that you've just had. It doesn't quite fit with what we've been doing. You don't know how people are re going to react. And we often think, what if they laugh? I won't say this. People might laugh at it. The best ideas come as jokes. Again, I'm on a mission to switch that mindset around so that instead of thinking, what if they laugh? People think, I think this might make people laugh. I'm going to say it. It works. It provokes people. I'll give you a quick story. I, I was doing, uh, when I was at What If, about 10 or so years ago, we were doing a project for Virgin Atlantic, the airline carrier. And at the time, they were still seen as a bit of the budget the budget airline, really. If you were going to fly from the UK to the US, go transatlantic, uh, and your business was ta taking you there, you'd want them to fly you British Airways. You know, if your business was doing any good, you'd expect to go British Airways, not Virgin Atlantic. So Virgin thought, we need some idea. We need to change this. We need to steal business class passengers from British Airways. Uh, and we'd done a lot of insight work. We were running an ideas session. Uh, and during that session, we weren't, we weren't coming up with much, you know, to give them a bit more champagne, make the seats a bit bigger, nothing very interesting. And then the marketing director said, look, if we're really serious about this, if we're serious about stealing business class passengers from British Airways, we need to do something they'd never do. 
We need to give all of our business class passengers their own prostitute. So as soon as they turn up at the lounge for the whole of the trip, they have their, their own prostitute with them all the way. And ever in the group, instead of saying to her, well, that, that's illegal and immoral, you're fired. They laughed, actually, uh, quite a lot more than just happened here. But in that group, so they laughed. They thought it was funny. Uh, and they said to her, what, what are you, why? What could we do with that? What are you talking, where did that even come from? And she said, well, you know, business class passengers, they're away from home. They might be stressed out, might be anxious about the flight and the meeting they've got over in New York. Maybe they've got a big talk. They want to be treated like kings and queens when they fly business class. British Airways would never do that. And it's, it's a stress relief. Stress relief is kind of legal no man's land over the Atlantic. Um, and they said, well, look, is there any way we can, well, let's take that insight, do something with it. And in the end, they turned that into giving all of their business class passengers an Indian head massage. It's a step or two back from that original idea, but they turned it into something that really worked, was really innovative at the time. It did steal a lot of business class passengers from British Airways. Uh, and they ran this ad, actually, BA don't give a shiatsu. And it was huge, big. They won lots of awards, but it came from somebody being provocative and thinking, I think, I'm gonna, I think this might make you all laugh. It did have a truth deep buried down somewhere, but it works. Okay, so a couple of quick exercises that you can use to come up with ideas. These are exercises that I know I've, comedians and comedy writers use a lot to really help them explore and have better ideas. And I know that we can get better in our own businesses if we do this. Acting it out, this is a, a still from my, uh, my sitcom Car Share. These are the two characters. They were kind of thrown together in a car share scheme uh, and they, they weren't going to get on. They're characters that just really shouldn't have been stuck together. That's the root of all comedy, really, conflict. But we'd written the whole series and then Paul and I co-wrote it with me. We thought, actually, it's the more that she can do to annoy him. So we thought, let's get two kitchen chairs together, sit them together, and we just acted it out. Improv, getting into improv is something we can all do much better. What it does is it kind of taps into some really creative bits of our brain. So I've done this with lots of, um, lots of brands and organizations. I, I did this with uh, M&S, Marks and Spencer's ready-made foods. They were looking to reinvent the stir fry. Not, not all innovation is driven out of a consumer need. I don't remember the riots on the streets. What we need is new types of stir fry. But we wanted to help them reinvent it. So this was back in the noughties when actually it was the law. If you were going to run a brainstorm, everyone had to be sat on bean bags in, big, in a big circle, just the way it was. So I used that. I, I created a, a circle out of the bean bags and said, right, there's a walk. And I gave each of the members of the brand and the marketing team a job, so somebody was the oil, somebody was the chicken, somebody was the sweet corn, somebody was the little uh, mange too. And I said, right, there's your wok, off you go. And they had to improvise being a stir fry. So the oil jumped in, started sizzling around a bit. Uh, the chicken jumped in, the sweet corn jumped in, they all jumped in, started to really enjoy it, started having a laugh, actually. And then I stopped them and said, okay, how was that for you? And the oil said, well, there was no way I was hot enough and everyone just started jumping in on top of me, so I don't know what we got. And the chicken said, actually, I'm worried I might kill somebody uh, because there's no way I'm fully cooked through. And the sweet girl said, well, that's ironic because I've been waiting for you to stop for ages. I was cooked through ages ago. I've already gone limp. Um, and so we said, is there anything interesting in that then that we could learn from? Uh, and they said, actually, yeah, people do. We do get a lot of complaints saying things don't cook at the right time. So they came up with... Uh, the, the stir fry where everything's cut to different sizes so it all cooked perfectly and made a real proposition out of it and did really well for them. So improvising, acting it out can be, require a bit of bravery, a lot of playfulness, but it gets some great ideas. One last technique I want to share with you uh, is about pushing it. One thing comedians are great at that we could all get better at is knowing how to push an idea, not settling for an average idea. If we're going to reinvent the future. We need to Push an idea and see what happens when we turn it up to 11. I'm going to show you a quick clip, uh, something that I think brings that to life a little bit. And the tech is going I to will. work. I will, but Lynn, please have a word with the builder because the other day his jeans were so far off his backside you could more or less see his anus. <laughs> <laughs> There's Dan. Dan! 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 <laughs> Dan! No, 
He's not seeing me. I'll get him later. Dan! <laughs> so, fine, fine. Steve Coogan, the writer and, and actor in that, he knew that was funny after three Dans. Four Dans. But he knew, he keep adding one more, it's going to get funnier until you get to the line where actually any more is diminishing returns. I think we could all learn a lot from that in any creative session. How far can we go? Where's the line? Where should we stop? Um, so the best, the best ideas come as jokes. If we want to make our thinking as funny as possible, like David Ogilvy said, I think we, there's a load of tools and techniques we could all learn from, from the world of comedy. That's my time up. It's been a real pleasure talking to you. Uh, thank you very much. Speak to you later. Okay, so jokes and humor to create an environment within a corporation, taking away the seriousness to stimulate the flow of ideas in an environment where there is freedom to fail. So thank you very much for that. And our next speaker, Michael, uh, he's more than actually just somebody who thrives in a rapidly evolving world to create new business opportunities. Actually, he, I would consider him to be a amateur or maybe professional cultural anthropologist because what he's doing is looking into specific new emerging market segments, in this case I'll talk about millennials, to see what it means to form a relationship through brands with an entirely different set of consumers who want to be empowered as never before. So Michael, please take it away. Wonderful, well thank you so much Tom for that very generous introduction and thank you to Pradeep and the rest of the committee um, for the invitation to be part of this program. I'm gonna pick up on a couple of the themes we've already heard about this morning. Who else found Paul's presentation first up this morning, utterly inspiring. Anyone else in that position? I just loved what he shared. I'm going to pick up on that theme, looking at this whole notion of the next generation. What are they looking for? How do they tick? As brand leaders, as advertisers, how do we bridge the gap and connect with them? And so we're going to talk about this group called the Millennials. We've heard a lot about the Millennials over the years, and in some parts of the world where I am from, in Australia, we often refer to this next generation, not as millennials, but actually a group called Generation Y. And you've probably heard those terms used interchangeably. And what would be very interesting this morning would be actually get a sense of what your perception of this group is. Because I'm guessing if I asked you to summarize this next generation of young people in one word, there'd be some really positive words that would be shared. Some of you would say, well, they're a generation who are adaptable, they're innovative, they're tech savvy, they're natural networkers and all those great things. But I'm guessing for a lot of you, if I were to ask you to summarize the next generation in one word, the words would be somewhat less flattering. You might use words like, well, this is a group who are self-obsessed, intellectually shallow, who are disloyal, who are presumptuous or entitled, pretentious sometimes, often seen as a bit arrogant. And what's interesting is we often hear a lot of negativity about this next generation, and I came across one observation recently that I think summarizes how many people see the next generation coming through in our society, and this was the observation here. The youth of today love luxury, this sense that they've been given too much, they've been pampered perhaps, they've got bad manners, they've got contempt for authority, they no longer rise when their elders enter the room, they contradict their parents, they tyrannize their teachers. Now what is interesting about this observation is this ain't new. This observation was credited by Plato to Socrates in 410 BC, okay? We have been slagging off young people for millennia, okay? We're very good at it. Same things were said about baby boomers and Generation X as well. What's interesting is as someone who studies a lot about the differences in attitudes between generations, we see the gap expressed not just in attitudes and values, but also in some very comical ways at times. I love some of the memes that we've seen pop up in recent years. Check out this meme here. Younger generations will never know the connection between these two items up on the screen here. Hands up if you know what I mean when I have a pencil and a cassette. They'll never know the joy of rewinding a cassette tape by hand, okay? What about this meme here? I love this one. A millennial anti-theft device in cars, just gold. And it's true, okay? And as we look at this next generation, and I've spent 15 years studying them, working with them. As you heard in the introduction, the initial part of my research was three and a half years interviewing 80,000 millennials right around the world 
doing essentially a sentiment analysis. What are they thinking? What makes them tick? What are they looking for? And I'm going to apologize up front. We've got 15 minutes together, and I'm going to summarize 27% of the world's population in 15 minutes. So it's going to require some generalities. But I bet some of this resonates with what you're seeing and experiencing right now. And if we look at just some headline figures about millennials as a cohort, let's just clear up a few things first. They're born typically between the early 80s and the late 90s. Depending on where you are from, these numbers will shift around a bit, but that is the most accepted, widely accepted range of birth years for this group. They are the largest generation in history. As we just said, 27% of the world's population. If we look in India, for instance, it's 34%. 440 million millennials in this country. They are a force to be reckoned with, not just numerically, but commercially or economically too. So check this out. They possess 35 to 45% of discretionary spending power. In Australia, it's 52%. They are a cashed up generation. And this is where it gets very interesting. This is a group who will enter their peak spending years in the mid 2020s. Peak spending years, if you look at most economists' modeling, is between age 46 and 50. They're going to be getting there within a decade. Now is the time to gear up, to be ready for this next generation coming through. And I guess to underscore how significant and important it is to understand what makes millennials tick, let's look at a case study of a brand that discovered the hard way just how difficult it can be to target this group. And I was doing some work recently with one of the brand management teams at Procter & Gamble, and I was talking to the team that actually head up their liquid softener division, part of their laundry care unit. And Mark's speaking shortly after us from Procter & Gamble. He could probably speak to this case study as well. The challenge they found in the fabric softener marketplace is that between 2007 and 2015, that product category declined in sales in North America by 15%. Now, Downey, which is one of Procter & Gamble's leading brands, they own just over 50% of the marketplace for this product category. In that same time period, lost 26% of sales. When they started to dig around and look at what was going on, what became resoundingly clear is that millennials were not buying this product. Why? because really, honestly, they don't know what it's for. They don't know why they would bother purchasing it. And so to make a very long story, a big case study, very short, the team at Procter & Gamble did some looking at how they could recraft the product, reposition the brand, change the brand messaging. And they did a number of things to target millennials, to inform the group as to why this product mattered. But the most simple but effective thing they did was change the name. They went from calling this fabric softener to, get this, fabric conditioner. The idea being that millennials know about conditioner for their hair, so if we just positioned it as a product that did the same sort of thing for your clothes as you do to your hair, that might resonate, and it did. The 12 months following this change, five to 6% jump in sales, a big part of it was about millennials. So how do we get inside the heads of this group? In the few minutes we've got left, I wanna look at three defining characteristics or hallmarks of this generation. And I bet you'll relate to a number of the things we'll talk about in the coming few moments. And the first characteristic we see across the board, and it'll be no massive surprise to you, and of course, Paul's session and even Simon's session showing the image of that toddler using an iPad like a magazine underscored how significant this is. First characteristic is they are digitally tethered. They are constantly plugged in, switched on. That immersive experience that Simon talked about is a real lived out experience and it's something they're addicted to. In fact, to underscore how addicted this generation are, check this out. A study from Pew Research found that 40% of millennials would rather lose a finger than their mobile phone. That's significant. Now, I love this as well, just underscoring how significant their desire to be switched on at all times is. Have a look at this. I came across this fire escape sign recently. I thought it was just brilliant. In case of fire, exit building before tweeting about it. And that summarizes how many of this group live through their devices. So if we look at what this means for them from a consumption perspective, it is very, very significant. So for instance, you consider the fact that for millennials, 54% of what they purchase, they purchase online, never stepping inside a physical store. That impacts the way they, embed, they engage with brands enormously. 
Now, in a study asking millennials about their intentions for their next major purchase, only 11% said they plan to visit a physical store. And check this out, this is massive. Have a look at this, 43% have made a voice device purchase in the last 12 months. That is 9% higher than any other demographic group. Very comfortable with home devices, for instance. Now, here's why this matters as marketers and brand leaders. These voice devices are not agnostic. They are often not there to necessarily serve the consumer or to serve the brand. They're designed to serve the platform. Now, to underscore how significant this is, in 2018, the most commonly requested search using Amazon Alexa was, Alexa, can you buy me some batteries? Most common question. Now, what's interesting is, up until 2018, the number one brand in North America was Duracell. Last year, they lost that crown. Any guesses which battery brand knocked them off top spot? Amazon's very own. Now, the reason this matters is that if you don't have a piece of the heart and mind of a millennial consumer, so when they ask the device in the corner of their room to order them a product, if they don't use your product name, your brand name, you've lost the battle right there. Brands will matter more than ever for this generation when it comes to how they're engaging with products. Number two, second thing we see in this group is they are experience-driven. They're a generation for whom experience is everything. In fact, interestingly, 78% would rather spend their cash on experiences than stuff. Now, that stands in contrast with what we often hear about them being a very materialistic generation. And see, the sweet spot for organizations and brands is how do you make engaging with your brand an experience that is valuable? that is remarkable, that stands out. And some big retailers have really come to the fore in recent months looking at doing this in store. For instance, you look at what Nordstrom and also Barney's have done using pop-up events with performance art, DJs to bring people into stores, particularly millennials, to create an experience, a visceral experience that is fun and interesting, but most importantly, is the key word, shareable. If you can create an experience with your brand that millennials want to share with their peers, that's the sweet spot. Now, interestingly, 70% of them admit they will purchase a product if it gives them something to share on social media. Now, we could spend an hour looking at how you do this. One key principle I'd love to give you or leave you with is this. If you want to really get a brand message to this generation, market through them, not to them. Use the established networks they've got. Give them something to share that is the most powerful spot to be. All right, number three, third thing we see with this group, and it goes directly to the core of what we heard from um, both Paul and Simon, but particularly Paul this morning. They're a generation who are socially minded. All the stuff we heard this morning from Paul about the need for consumers to resonate with your brand values is, is true for every generation, but especially for millennials. Two thirds of them will make product purchase choices based on the corporate values of that brand or that product. Now, interestingly too, 73% of them will spend more on a product if it is sustainable or has values that align with their own. Now we've seen a number of big brands realize this in recent times. For instance, a quote on the screen there from Caroline Schaffel, who's the co-president and um, jewelry giant Chopard, and she said this, the social conscience of millennials was a key factor in them choosing to go to 100% ethically sourced gold for their product lines in the last 18 months. All about understanding the values of millennials and targeting them specifically. Another brand that's done this well in recent times that's really captured the hearts and minds of millennials is Warby Parker. And I love their buy a pair, give a pair, idea. This whole notion, if you purchase a pair of glasses, someone else who needs one gets one too. Tom's Shoes did a similar thing. This is the stuff that really resonates with millennials. The more you can not just espouse your corporate values, but actually live them out, that's what's necessary with this group. All right, we're almost out of time. We'll have some discussion in a couple of moments, and I didn't want to go over time at all. What I will do, though, before we finish up, I'll put my details up on the screen there. Feel free to have a look at the website, a whole pile of things that might be valuable up there, a whole lot of resources and blog posts and bits and pieces. So feel free to have a look at that if that would be valuable. The other thing that um, we put together a little while ago is actually a, a bit of a deep dive video unpacking some of the stuff we've talked about, but in more depth. 
Um, you know, we looked at three of the defining characteristics of this group. Um, in this video, I think I'll go through seven of the characteristics of millennials, but also some strategies about how to bridge the gap. Um, if it'd be useful, I can send a link to that video, because it'll go a lot deeper than we've had time to go into this morning. Um, best way to get a hold of that link, and feel free to either do this now, or we'll probably leave it open until later tonight. So if you go to my website, so michaelmcqueen.net, on the homepage, there's a little blue button that says conference code. You'll need to click on that blue button. Um, I think it brings up a dialog box that will ask for your first name, the best email address for us to send the link to for that video, and it'll ask for a code. You do need a code to get this. The code for this event today is IAA. So if you put that code in, we'll flick an email out probably tomorrow with a link um, to that video on the millennial research. So feel free to have a look at that if that would be of value. But, you know, just as we draw all this together, and we'll talk a lot more in the Q&A shortly about this challenge of embracing change and innovation, how do we reposition our brands as not just demographic change happens, but all these changes unfold. I guess if there's one encouragement I'd love to leave with you, it'd be a quote that is actually 2,600 years old, but I reckon it is more relevant today than ever before. As brand leaders facing the scale of the changes that are hitting us on every side, technologically and in terms of demographics and marketplace shifts. The encouragement I give to you is this quote from the great Chinese philosopher Lao Tzu who said this, resisting change is a little bit like trying to hold your breath. Even if you are successful, okay, it's not going to end well. And I guess that would be my simple encouragement as we consider the challenge of adapting in the face of not just demographic but also technological change. Can't fight it. We can't ignore it. All we can really do is embrace and adapt in the face of this stuff. So I hope that was useful. And I'll hand back to Tom for our um, Q&A. Thank you so much. Okay. So two very different presentations, but what do they have in common? Well, I think um, both of you are saying exactly what Lao Tzu said in the last chart, that it is very dangerous to resist change. You're talking about how you create an environment in a corporation to embrace change, open up the minds, and you're actually talking about something that's even more challenging, and that's how do you reestablish a relationship between brand and a new set of consumers that is more digitally connected, that does demand equality and authenticity with brands and wants to have a relationship and is demanding value exchange. So I'd like to actually start with one question uh, to Michael, uh, a cultural question if you don't mind. Uh, you started talking about the millennials being from 1980 to 1999, all right? But let's talk a little bit about millennials in other cultures very quickly. Chinese millennials, they call them Zhou Ho, post-95s, or even Ling Ling Ho, post-zeros. India, I'm sure, is more young as well. What's the difference between an Indian or a Chinese or a non-Western millennial and a Western millennial. Well, if you look at China specifically, you'd be better to speak to that. A um, bit of a plug for your work around understanding that market. I mean, you've got a breadth of experience that I don't have there. And I'm just a moderator today. Just so. a moderator today. Check out his book, very good book. Um, but what's interesting is if you look across different cultures, up until Generation X, cultural nuances mattered a lot more. Whereas from the millennials forward, we've had what has emerged to be known as a global youth culture. Mm -hmm. There are differences. I mean, it would be, it'd be arrogant and naive to say, oh, no, 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 every generation, almost when this year and this year is the same. And it'd be silly to say that of one national culture. There's always you know, diversity. But if you look at that more broadly, it would be naive to say this all holds true. What we're seeing, though, is that What's often presented on the outside as cultural difference, you scratch beneath the surface, and so many of the foundational attitudes and values are alike. Mm. And I've found this working in you know, multiple markets around Asia, and Asia is really interesting, whereas you'll deal with young people who on the outside appear to have a deference to authority and a, a stronger work ethic and not some of those individualistic values we see in the US and Australia and the UK. But you don't have to scratch too far beneath the surface to see that a lot of their, their core values have actually been informed by pop culture and what's online. And they're keeping in step with the West in ways we've never seen before. This is causing, by the way, massive friction. Look in Japan, for instance, where young men don't have the same work ethic and commitment to the company that their dads did and their granddads did. And the conflict that causes at a national level is enormous. So 
Global youth culture is an interesting one to watch. So you're basically suggesting that due to connectivity and globalism that everything is converging upon itself. That the generations yeah. are becoming more similar. Yep. And yet, on the other hand, some people might argue that due to the fundamental hierarchical nature of Chinese society, say, or Indian society, perhaps the role of social currency and the need to tweet more times before you enter the uh, exit of the building with a fire uh, yeah. could, could be something. But uh, we can leg wrestle about it later. I'd like to land, though, a little bit more in terms of implementation. Mm -hmm. Both of you guys are asking companies to embrace the unknown, be brave, and uh, change. How do they do that? It's a structural issue, obviously. You can't just have a workshop and you can't just have a manifesto that says you're free to fail. Things need to be changed structurally. So can you guys give me your thoughts, first starting with, with you, Tim, on very briefly, what are the first steps companies need to make to actually have this land and have this be part of operations? Well, the first step, I think, is to consider culture. I think it's all about culture of which structure, leaderships, all uh, processes are all part of it. So the first step, I think, is just to recognize that actually our current culture in an organization may not be the right one for the future. Uh, and so to start to look to think, how do we create a culture of creativity, a culture of innovation, I think, a culture that is uh, em empowering of change. Um, and that takes a long time. So the, if the first thing is recognize that we need to do something about it, the second thing is to recognize that it doesn't happen overnight. Culture takes a long time to change, but it's vital to start there. I think I'm with Peter Drucker, who said culture eats strategy for breakfast. It's true. Well, culture takes a long time to change, but uh, it's a little bit tautological. How do you implement the structural changes so culture can change? Mm. What about the leadership? What about how departments are structured, product silos. I mean, what do you do to make sure that there really is a genuine customer centricity that can take root within corporations? I think the first... Especially ones that are traditional, not born as digital mm -hmm. ecosystems. Yeah, and we've seen some great examples of that sort of structural transformation in recent times. So look at um, higher electrical in China, for instance. You look at um, a number of banks in Europe. In Australia, the ANZ Bank is a good one to look at. And the starting point for transformation is always going to be a willingness to acknowledge the fact that it's required. And that is difficult when the platform's not burning. There's no existential threat. Um, you know, I was doing some work with Toyota last year and learned that one of the ethos in the Toyota business comes from their former global chairman, a guy named Hiroshi Okuda, who said the best time to reform business is when business is good. And that's profoundly true, but really difficult because it's also the hardest time to reform business because there is no existential threat. And so my encouragement, if you want to start that cultural shift, the encouragement I give to clients and I apply to myself as well is, how do you foster healthy paranoia? You know, Andy Grove of Intel fame put it well when he said, only the paranoid survive. And that, that gets you uncomfortable, that, that sense of operating like you've got a target painted on your back, because it tends to engender the two most important attributes for agility. And they both start with H, hunger and humility. At the moment you lose those two things, the moment you lose that hunger for the new, trying different things, stretching ourselves, or the humility to realize, hey, maybe we haven't arrived. I mean, the old saying is true, the moment you think you've made it, you've passed it. And so for all of us, how do we ward against any sense of complacency or arrogance? And so healthy paranoia is often the best place to start trying to fire that up because that gets the culture uncomfortable, which sort of tills the soil and gets you ready to enact change. And I think, I think to, just to add to that, I think that comes from leadership, but making sure throughout the organization that same uh, level of accepting change through you know, hunger and humility. Yeah, and I, and I, think, I, I also think that transparency is fundamental. I mean, you have to have uh, infinite transparency, radical transparency, so ideas can move from one to another, free-flowing. Like, yeah, like a river. And fail, and, 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 and we learn and celebrate failure, actually. That's a big yeah, part of it. Salesforce does that very well. But Salesforce yeah. is actually a company that was born digital. Uh, I'd like you guys to think of one company that is traditional, that has to deal with the 400,000 employees or the 20,000 employees, that doesn't rely on 
infinite access of uh, the digital ecosystem. Which companies do you admire that have effectively transformed their ways of doing, and how do they do it? So if I start with one uh, within a, uh, well, it's an ad agency actually, so, so a place I work, so it's in, it, it, of itself wasn't huge, but part of a huge global corporate By ad the way, agency. You're, you're not allowed to call them ad agencies anymore. Am I you're, not? No, you have to call them, um, Trevor. you are an engineer of media centric, uh, media neutral. An integrated communications platform. functional <laughs> organization <laughs> globally called, it was McCann Erickson, but one office where I worked. It was the place actually that allowed me to move from being an account director to being a planner to being a, a copywriter. You know, I think it, it allowed me because it fitted the culture of the places. They, they were up for change. And how that affected their success as an office is way back in the 90s when everyone else was still calling themselves ad agencies and celebrating you know, all about the TV ad. Um, they allowed, in a di very dynamic way, for, for different disciplines to flourish and grow and see if it worked through people's passions. So some were passionate about direct marketing, others then the internet. This is the mid-90s, so one or two people said, I think, there's, think it's going to be a thing. And, and then, this is in Manchester, This too, is in Manchester. Not London. No, so McCann Erickson in Manchester. But it was seen as a bit of a maverick within the global uh, system. Um, but it was allowed to do this because it was successful. But they would try things and sometimes it would fail, sometimes it would succeed and a department would grow. It was like an organic or, uh, system, ecosystem, where a culture right from the top in that, in that uh, company um, allowed this kind of dynamic change. And I, th I think that's a great way of having one, a culture that can spot and grow with different opportunities. It's so, so ended up being a hugely successful part of their... You're suggesting it's institutionalizing test and fail, yeah. agility, rapid fire, to yeah. eliminate freedom of failure, uh, rooted in people's passions and genuine interests. Mm. Yeah. Right? Um, how about you? Well, so, it's such a good question because I think it's naive for us to just look at the Googles and the Facebooks of the world and try and transplant what works there into an organization that has a culture and structure that doesn't fit that. And I've got to say that when... This is the stuff I've grappled with most in the last 12, 18 months, is how do you try and take what works in that tech startup world and apply it when that's not the DNA you're working with? Um, and I know like a lot of you got um, this book yesterday because I think they're sold out of it, but there's a chapter in here that was the hardest one to write for that reason, um, because it was looking at this whole area of what are some of those traditional businesses that have adopted that culture and mindset, and there's some, but not many, not as many as you'd like. One of my favorites, though, is Corning. So Corning, where 181 years old this year. What I love about Corning is they, they model that wonderful principle of reforming your business before you're forced to. So, I mean, for instance, the turn of last century, most of their revenue came from making light globes. They were one of the best at doing it. They actually provided Edison with the glass he made to use the first electric filament light globe. Problem was they could see that disruption was coming, even before we called it disruption. As the marketplace got flooded, that would become a commoditized product. So while they were still making good money from it, they moved away from their reliance on light globes. And they started to focus on other things, like the cook and kitchenware market. Most of us still think of corning as the stuff in our kitchens at home. Today, very little of their revenue comes from that product. They've continually reinvented themselves and their structure to stay agile. Today, most of their revenue comes from, like on our smartphones, Gorilla Glass, corning make that. And one of the big markets for them is the medical device market. I was working with Medtronic last year, one of their big medical device companies, and they're telling me one of their products is a capsule you can swallow that goes throughout your system taking video footage. And um, they said the little lenses in these capsules are made by Corning. This is a company that, even though they're old, have been willing to adapt consistently as time's gone on. And, and some of the other ones, the WL Gores of the world, the higher electricals, these are good examples of big, lumbering old businesses that are doing a really good job. But it's okay. an uphill battle. So I think we've run out of time. Um, but in conclusion, three basic points from this uh, very lively uh, discussion and your great presentations. One is mindsets need to change and corporations need to work hard to open up to embrace the new. And this is really about reduction of fear. And you were talking about it through laughter and humor. You're also saying that we need to reinvent the relationship between consumers and brands because consumers in the millennial generation is more empowered than ever before. But what we're also saying is there is no easy route to Rome. There's many a slip between the cup and the lip. 
that companies have to think very meticulously about how their organizations are structured and the sequencing of reform that is going to make them truly agile and responsive to what's changing every day all around us. So with that, I thank both of you. Thank you, Tim. Thank you, Michael, for very stimulating presentations. Thank you. Thanks, sir. Well done, yeah. A token of gratitude to our wonderful speakers. Thank you very much. May I please invite on stage Mr. Raj Nayak to kindly present a token of appreciation to our three panelists. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, as Mr. Nayak steps to the center of stage, could we have a huge round of applause for Mr. McQueen, Mr. Reed, and Mr. Dr. Rock. Thank you very, very much, gentlemen. This is to inform all our guests in the audience that we will be listening through the tea break. It's all about sharing here. So in case you are truly, truly looking forward to your coffee, then it's time for you to step.